You are now listening to the Music Business Streams podcast, brought to you by KDMR Music. Hey guys, thank you for tuning back into the Music Business Dreams podcast, where we teach you how to make your music business dreams come true. I'm your host, Brandon Jackson, and I'm super excited about today's episode. Uh, So if you listened last week, this was our first ever solo episode, and I was just talking to you guys about scams that I'd seen in the music business both over the years and some that have been ramping up here lately. Um, So if that's something you're interested in, you should definitely go back and check it out. But I wanted to come to you guys today with another solo episode uh, because some interesting things have been happening in the last week. So last week, the Music Modernization Act was signed into law by President Trump. And I posted a breakdown of that bill Uh, just after it passed the Senate about two weeks ago. And so the video that I did on that subject ended up trending when President Trump signed the bill. So our audience has nearly doubled. Well, it's more than doubled on YouTube. Uh, The podcast has grown. All of that as a result of this video kind of going viral and getting, I think it's at like 6,000 plays right now. So with that said, we've had a lot more people join the Indie Club in the last week. We've had a lot more people asking questions on social media. So today I wanted to do a Q&A episode just to address some of the questions you guys have been asking, some of the questions I've been seeing a lot over the years. Uh, Of course, if you guys have been following us for any period of time, then you know we're all over social media. We're on Instagram. We're on Twitter. We're on Facebook. uh, We're on YouTube, of course. And then we're also in a private community called the Indie Club. So between all those different mediums, I get questions all the time and I try to respond to them all no matter where they pop up. But I'm only human. We're only human here. So Some of them do get missed. So today I wanted to take a look at some of the uh, more pressing questions, uh, some of the more common questions, things that I think are going to affect the majority of you guys as you go on with your music careers. So we're going to start off with questions about the Music Modernization Act uh, that came in the comments of that video. Uh, We've got some questions about marketing and branding. We've got some questions about touring and live shows and then just other kind of general questions as well. So now, again, I do try to respond to every single question that I get without fail. But again, I'm only human. So if you guys want your questions answered on a more regular basis, there are two ways to do that. You can join the Indie Club on Facebook. And again, the Indie Club is our private networking community of artists, managers, basically all sorts of aspiring music industry professionals. So you can join that on Facebook. It's at kdmr.us slash Indie Club. And of course, I will leave the link in the show notes. And then if you want one on one advice, uh, I've got a new option for you. You can actually book a coaching call. So if you go to kdmr.us slash coach me, then you can schedule a one hour long call with me. The calls take place on Saturdays because I don't want you to be distracted with your job or your family. I want you to be able to go into a room sit down for an hour and really think about your career and your strategy moving forward. So the calls do take place. They're either over the phone or on Skype or Zoom. And I do record the session no matter what so that you can keep it for your records and look back on it and make sure you have a record of all the advice that I gave you in that hour. So that's something you want to do. Again, kdmr.us slash coach me. And I will leave the link in the description below. So without further ado, Let's get into some of these questions. Again, it's been a wild week since that video went viral and you guys had a lot of questions about the Music Modernization Act. So we are going to start with a question from Mike. Now, I guess I should give a broad strokes overview. Basically, the Music Modernization Act is something that has been in the works for about seven years now. And without going too deep into the weeds, it's basically updating U.S. copyright law to make sure that streaming and tech companies are paying songwriters and publishers their mechanical royalties on time. And it also makes sure that they actually get them. Um, Basically, the big problem with the way the Copyright Act had been written, and of course, some of these laws have been on the books since back in 1909, uh, but 
they didn't have a way to accurately identify the songwriters and publishers of each song. And so the trade off for that was, well, just file a notice of intent with the copyright office. And if they don't claim it after a certain amount of time, oh, well, uh, whatever collection agency just gets to keep that money. But the streaming services weren't really doing their due diligence to find those artists and they were being opened up to a lot of lawsuits. So the Music Modernization Act kind of shields the streaming services from getting those lawsuits while also creating a bunch of programs to help the artists and the songwriters get the royalties. So they're going to be creating a database uh, with all songwriter information and publisher information that is going to be kept up to date and paid for by the streaming services. And then they are also um, creating what's called the Mechanical Licensing Collective. And basically that is going to be like a new performing rights organization that just distributes mechanical royalties. And basically it's going to be their job to track down the songwriters instead of the streaming companies. So, All of those things are going to help songwriters get paid more. There are other aspects to the bill. And if you want to learn more, I did a full breakdown on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash KDMR music. So with that said, there are some questions that you guys had about the bill. I'm going to start with a question we got on YouTube from Mike. Mike said, will we lose streaming from YouTube? The answer is no. Uh, There's been a scare that, okay, if these tech companies are going to be paying more, does that mean we're going to all of a sudden have a shortage of music? Um, And the answer is no. The tech companies were supposedly paying these royalties already. They just weren't making it to the final destination. But another thing to realize is that the uh, Music Modernization Act really deals with mechanical royalties. And what a mechanical royalty is, is the payment or the royalty that is generated whenever a song is physically sold. Now, I know with streaming, it's kind of weird because the copyright law has recently been updated to count an interactive stream as a form of a sale. It's much less valuable than an actual download, but it does generate a mechanical royalty, albeit a small one. With YouTube... Uh, they kind of have a way around that because they're not the ones that put the content on the platform. It's all user generated content. And so with the exception of the YouTube music app, YouTube isn't paying out those mechanical royalties because they're not really tracking who's being getting paid. So that's why you have services like Vivo and Audiam and things like that to kind of track down whose music is being used and just kind of generate some money with ad revenue. So the long story short, the royalties that YouTube would owe are separate from the royalties that are defined in the Music Modernization Act. So uh, to answer your question, Mike, no, you're not losing streaming from YouTube. Uh, Degam says, is this going to be bad for streaming companies? And again, It's not going to be bad for streaming companies because they were already paying this money out anyway. Again, this is just going to help all those funds reach their final destination, which should be the artist. Now, uh, let's see. WKZ Works asked, how does this apply to artists or publishers outside of the United States? Great question. Now, most of the global music industry is based in the United States, especially if you're affiliated with a major publisher or record label. So for the most part, the um, you guys, whoever's in another country, you're going to be partnering with the United States to get your royalties from any songs that are played in the United States. Now, obviously, if your songs are streamed outside of the United States, then that's a separate thing between, you know, you guys as collection agencies. Um, What this is, is something called neighboring rights, right? And basically neighboring rights are the same as your performance royalties, your mechanical royalties, you know, for us who are, who call the United States home, those are just royalties. But to collect those same royalties overseas in other countries, those are called neighboring rights. They're the rights that you have to give music to our neighbors in other countries is the best way I can explain that to you. Um, so for those who are outside of the United States, 
you would be technically exercising your neighboring rights by collecting royalties from the United States. But your files will be kept in that database as well. As an independent songwriter, it's just going to be important for you to make sure that you register all of your works with the Copyright Office and that you submit all of the required documentation to that mechanical licensing collective once it is up and running, which will be in about two years. So let's move on to the next question. Manita says, will remakes and tributes count? Yes, remakes and tributes do generate a mechanical royalty. And I think I should kind of take a step back uh, and explain a little bit more about what mechanical royalties are. So again, mechanical royalty is a royalty that is generated for the songwriter and the publisher. So basically it protects the people who own the rights to the actual musical composition. So the if I decided I was going to write a song and I put it down on sheet music, my creation that's on the sheet music counts as the composition. The sounds that you hear, um, if Rihanna decides to cover my song, that is the sound recording or the master recording, and that is owned by the record label. If you're an independent artist, you own that master as well. So we're talking about two different royalties. And uh, let's get back to this question. So the remakes or tributes, while you do have a separate master that is that remake and that tribute, the underlying composition belongs to someone else. It's a cover song. So, yes, you do generate a mechanical royalty to the original songwriter and publisher of that work. Um, so if you ever see like uh, a Luther Vandross album, Luther Vandross was famous for doing covers of other people's songs, um, especially like Christmas songs, stuff like that. The record label is making money from the CD being sold. And of course, Luther Vandross is making a little bit of that, too. But whoever wrote Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas is also getting paid, even though they're not the ones singing on the album. So there is an example of that. And um, so those remakes will count in the Music Modernization Act. And it's going to help the people who use that music or that composition to find the rightful owner, get the license and pay them. Um, and let's see another question. Composer Lady One asked, do you know the breakdown of the unclaimed money that will be absorbed by the musicians that are registered? So I do have to admit I misspoke a little bit um, as it stands in the Music Modernization Act um, or just in general. There are a lot of royalties that go unclaimed because, again, songwriters can't be found. They've changed addresses. They didn't know that they were generating those royalties. So. Uh, there's a lot of royalty payments that don't make it to the rightful owner. As a matter of fact, a study that was done in 2015 by Berklee College of Music found that anywhere between 20 and 50 percent of music royalty payments do not make it to their final respective destinations. And before the law was passed, what would happen with those extra royalties is that they were absorbed by the collection agencies or, you know, Harry Fox, uh, the uh, ASCAP, BMI, you know, the performing rights organizations. After a while, if no one claimed that, they'd be able to absorb those. And that same rule kind of still applies in the Music Modernization Act, except the collection agency, which is called the Mechanical Licensing Collective, does not have to or does not get to keep those royalties. Instead, they're going to distribute them to the top music publishers based on market share. So there's a little bit of an uproar right now because basically if someone has unclaimed royalties, then they're technically an independent songwriter. So what's happening is those royalties after three years, if they haven't been claimed, are going to be distributed to someone who had nothing to do with creating that song. So that's why some people are upset about. I still think even with all that said, it's a win for songwriters and uh, publishers because there's no hidden incentive for the mechanical licensing collective to just not look for someone. Either way, at the end of three years, they're going to turn that money over to someone. So it doesn't matter to them if it's the publisher or if it's the actual songwriter. So there's still a benefit for them for looking for the regular or the actual songwriter. 
And I think we've got one more question about the Music Modernization Act, and it comes from Ty. Ty says, as a producer and an engineer, does this mean I'll be paid for every stream? So the Music Modernization Act, or the MMA, I'm going to start calling it, um, basically added a section um, or a bill that's called the AMP Act. And what that bill says is that um, songwriters or artists can actually assign a certain percentage of their master recording royalty to go to the to producer or the engineer. So obviously this is something that a producer or the engineer has to um, negotiate as part of their agreement to work for that artist. But what was happening before was artists were filing these notices to sound exchange to say, hey, I want my engineer to have a take of this. And because they're not the artist and they're not the record label, it's like, OK, well, who is this third person and why do they get a percentage? So um, they were accepting those letters as, OK, this is a designation and, you know, we'll give that two percent or that three percent to this engineer. The AMP Act or the MMA just made that the law or legal to do. So it's an accepted practice and it's now legal for them to do it. Um, so if you negotiate those royalties, then yes, you'll start to get some money when those songs are streamed by places like Pandora. If you don't, then you won't. And if you did not before, you're not going to start getting back royalties for other things that you've done. So, I hope I answered all of you guys' questions about the Music Modernization Act, um, and I hope it was helpful. Now, we've got some other questions here um, about touring and live shows. So I'm going to go ahead and Lala asked, how do you start getting gigs? And my answer to that is, if you're going to if you're just starting out, let's say you've just recorded your first few songs then the best way to get started getting gigs is to just go out and play open mics or different artist showcases in your local area. Now, I did a video on this a while back called How to Break Into Your Local Music Scene. And it's so important for you to be active in your scene. Like if you live in New York, then there are hundreds and hundreds of small bars and clubs and places to play music. Find one and play there. And the reason you want to do that is because the live show is the most powerful way to win over a fan. Um, and I, I know most of us, you know, who make music also love music. You know, I'm sure you've been at a bar to see one of your friends perform and someone else who's on the bill just kind of takes you by surprise. And you're like, wow, I really like that guy or I really like that group. And all of a sudden you're a fan because the power of live music is that not only do you hear the music, but you get to see the person's personality. You get to see how they uh, carry themselves on stage and you really can be won over as a whole just from seeing them that one time. So making your presence known in your local scene, it's going to be important. And again, it starts with just going out there and performing. Uh, go out to an open mic, go to a showcase, make sure you stay to the end. If it's like one of those rap showcases or one of those things like 100 opening acts, you want to make sure the people that are throwing those events know who you are and they know you're not just trying to leech off of them. Um, of course, anyone will take notice of you if you have talent. But what will shine even more than your talent is the way you carry yourself and if you're respectful of their time and their uh, their presence. So. You know, it's a lot of politics, especially depending on the area where you live. But the short answer is just go out there and play. And the more you go out there and play, the more people recognize you, the more you build a fan base, the more there will be a demand for you to play shows of your own. And before you know it, you'll start to see uh, perform or promoters reaching out to you. Or what you'll see is you've got this huge list of fans if you're building your email list and things like that. And you'll start to do polls. Just go on Facebook and say, hey, I want to play some shows. Where would you guys want to see me perform? And all of a sudden you'll see, you know, 55 people said, oh, come to Boston. So then you can take that to the promoter and say, hey, I've got 50 people that want to see me in Boston. If your venue holds 45, I'll pack it out. 
right? Obviously, those are small numbers, but it's a start. So that is how you go about getting shows. Um, And kind of along those same lines, someone asked, how do you book shows for an artist if you're a manager who doesn't live in the same country, the same town, or the same area? And funny enough, that's actually a part of my story. Um, Pardon me for a second. (laughs) Had to take a sip of water. But um, the way I got started in artist management was I was actually interning for a record label and we went to a festival in Atlanta and that's where I met my first artist. She was living in Toronto, Canada at the time. She still lives in Canada, but not in the same area. And I was living in North Carolina. So we were literally in two different countries. We hit it off and she said, hey, I'd like you to be my manager. I didn't really know what a manager did at the time, but I was like, sure, I'll do that. And so a big part of the reason that we ended up kind of parting ways years later was that it was very difficult for me to help get her opportunities in her home country. And that was something that was important to her. Now, knowing what I know now, there are definitely ways around that. Um, The easiest way for you to help someone get shows in an area that you're not familiar with is to hire a booking agent, right? The famous ones are like CAA and APA, um, but those are for like, you know, bigger stars. But you can find a booking agent that's willing to work with you, especially if you're putting into practice a lot of those uh, do-it-yourself or DIY strategies that I teach in my book and in my courses. Um, You have an email list, You have social media accounts. You have this proof that you have a following wherever you're going, right? Fans are the key that will unlock any door in the music business. And I say that until I'm blue in the face, but it's true. If you have 100 fans in Amsterdam, you can find someone to pay you to fly to Amsterdam and play a concert. It's possible. It's been done. Um, People like uh, the rapper Odyssey have made a career out of touring internationally, and he started just by emailing every booking agent he could or every club promoter he could. Like, hey, I have fans that live where you are. I'll sleep on your floor. Just pay me a little bit and I'll come out. And he's been bringing out more and more fans every year, and he's made his career out of it. It's been really cool to watch. So. That is how you um, that's the easiest way to get um, shows outside of your home town or state. But I'm going to tell you again, as a former artist manager, it was very difficult because the the biggest job of an artist manager is to be an advocate for your artist. Right. Artists are kind of sensitive types or I don't mean to lump anyone into a certain category they don't want to be in. But generally speaking, artists can be introverted. They're not really fans of talking to people a lot. They tend to talk through their music and that's it. So if you're an artist manager, your job is to kind of be that hype man for the artist and to be that advocate, to be that person that's shouting from the rooftops. Hey, I've got this artist and they are the greatest act in the world. So. If you're not living in an area where it's easy for you to bump into certain people, then the only way to really advocate for those people is to do it online. And, you know, you can search for email addresses and things like that. um, But there's really not going to be any substitute for speaking with people on the phone or in person. So it's going to be tough, but you're going to have to go out there and hit the pavement. Um, Take a listen to our episode, our podcast episode with Sam Fisher. I believe it was episode 14. He talked about how he went about building connections, how he cold called A&Rs at record labels, how he one by one built the relationships that allowed him to now shop artists to record labels all the time. It is possible. The music business is not as closed off as you think. So it's possible, but it is going to take a lot of hard work. So those were our questions about touring, and we're going to end this with my favorite subject, marketing. 
how to market your music, how to find more fans, and how to make more money. That's that's what I love to talk about. So uh, we have a question from Mariami, and she says, you know, I'm great at creating content like, you know, um, I'm great at creating songs and videos and things like that, but I don't know how to establish a brand voice and make that consistent and make it so that people want to keep coming back. And the answer to this is, I mean, if you don't know what a brand voice is, it's basically like if you, let's say you go to Coca-Cola's Twitter feed, you expect to see a certain type of post. You expect to see upbeat, lots of smiles and things like that. And so I did a video about what a brand is, um, and I'll link that in the show notes as well. But your brand is kind of the persona that you put on for the public. Um, You know, how people view you, how people see you is your brand. So we talked about Eminem. Eminem's like the underdog. That's his brand. He's always wearing like sweatpants and stuff, not because he can't afford regular clothes, but because they make him look more unassuming and like he's still trying to get in fighting shape because he's that underdog character. So a lot of times, you know, because we're artists and we talk about branding and entrepreneurship and things like that, we forget that the product that us musicians sell is a very emotional product. It's not something that we sell because, you know, it looks good or it tastes good or it's a commodity, right? If you get hungry, you're going to go buy some food. You're never going to buy music because you're hungry. You're going to buy music because something about it appeals to you. It connects to a memory that you may have or it elicits a certain emotion in you. That's why people buy music. And You know, when you're selling such an emotional product, it's important to be a real person because brands don't sell music. People sell music. Right. That's why you love your favorite artists, because you can relate to them. So the answer to the question is just be yourself. Uh, You don't have to put on some persona. You don't have to be some character. You can just be you. And what you'll find is the more you decide to be yourself, the more people will relate to you because they're like, wow, she's just like me or he's just like me. And, you know, that's what's going to connect those people to you. And that is how you're going to keep people coming back to your content. So don't overthink it. Just be yourself. Now, if you want to talk about aesthetics and things like that, we can talk about that. Um, But as far as your voice what comes out of your mouth, how you speak, what your tone is in your uh, Instagram captions, things like that. Just let that be from the heart. So the next question comes from Russell. Russell says, I'm a singer, songwriter, producer, multi-instrumentalist, an audio engineer. But for some reason, I have a real problem promoting and marketing all my skills to create a constant flow of work. And my answer to that is, well, to borrow a phrase from my wife, you're doing too much, man. So my advice, and this is kind of the advice you'll get from a lot of people who are entrepreneurs, is to just pick one area of expertise and stick with it. And that's not to say that you can't show off your skills, but what it does help you do is focus and bring all of those skills into one place. Because when you try to do so many things at once, the commu- the uh, message that you communicate unintentionally is that, you know, you're not good at any one thing. You know, the whole phrase, you're a jack of all trades and a master of none. When you say, OK, I'm a singer, a writer, a dancer, a sculptor, a painter, a music, music video person, I'm a photographer. Right. And it's possible that you're skilled at all of those things, but you have to find a way to tell people what you do without scaring them. So my advice to you um, would be to just pick one of those things off that list. Right. And so if you're going to talk about uh, ways to narrow that down, then, you know, there's two ways you can approach it. You can approach it by which thing do you love to do the most, which would be ideal or which thing is going to make you the most money, right? Because practically you need money to live. So 
I'd say pick from one of those categories and just pick one thing to market yourself for. Um, there's a famous story of how a young guru became Jay-Z's go-to engineer. And it's a similar story for Derek Ali, who works with Kendrick Lamar and the whole TDE camp. But basically, they were in the studio doing their normal job. Of course, a recording engineer's job is really just to set up microphones and make sure the levels are right. And then the mixing engineer will come in and clean up frequencies and things like that to make a song sound radio ready. Uh, Young Guru is kind of famous for giving feedback to the artist about their creative work. Right. He started with Memphis Bleak and that kind of bled over into a relationship with Jay-Z. So you can absolutely put your creative skills as a songwriter, as an artist on display, you know, in your role as an engineer. But you may not want to just, you know, hyphenate yourself to death because people are going to start thinking, OK, he doesn't do anything worthwhile because if he was that good at all those things, I would have heard of him already. So I hope that helps you, Russell. Um, let's see. We've got a couple of more questions and we're almost done. So, uh, OK, our last question comes from Adam. Adam says, I took a Facebook ads course and I've boosted my artist to over 10,000 likes, but I still lack direction and I don't know how to convert them to dollar signs. That's what he said. So, you know, this is a shameless plug, by the way. I wrote a book called The Music Marketing Guidebook, and I released it the same day uh, this podcast launched on the 4th of July. And the book is, you know, how to find fans, convert listeners and make more money with your music. And the reason it's titled that way is because there is a journey that you have to lead fans on. It's not enough for someone to listen to your music a couple times. It's not enough for them to just like your page on Facebook. But at every point, you have to be leading your fans down this journey to eventually becoming customers and then super fans, at least if you want to have a financially successful career. And so the stages, we'll, we'll, we can talk about the fan journey and we don't have a ton of time, but I want to get into it a little bit for you. So basically, there are, I'd say, five stages um, to the fan journey. The first is them being a stranger, right? Uh, they see you on TV or they hear your song on the radio and they're like, huh, OK, that guy's cool. Right. And maybe they follow you on social media. And so now they're a casual listener. They followed you on Twitter. Or they followed you on Facebook. If they see a post, they might press play, you know, or if they see something with your name on it, they might take a look. But they're not like a diehard fan or anything. Eventually, you're going to make an offer to them. They're going to see something they like. And you're going to want to get them on your email list. And once they're on your email list, then I'd say you can call them an actual fan. Right. So you having them on your your Facebook like page is just step two in the process. Your next step is to try to get them on your email list. So make an offer of some sort, whether it's a free EP, whether it's a free video series breaking down how you made your last album. Something that's going to say, hey, I understand you want to make a deeper connection to what we've got going on. I want to give you that. I need something in return, though. Can you give me your email address so that we can stay in contact with each other? And that's the trade off. And if they're willing to give you that email address, that's something sacred. That's like a girl giving you her phone number for the first time. It's a big deal. So if she gives you that, you know, then you know it's real. And if they give you your email address, then you know they're a real fan. Um. So now now that you've got them on your email list and they're a fan, they're staying updated about, you know, your tour schedule and stuff like that because you're emailing them regularly. And then you want to make an offer. You want to make some sort of an offer so they go from being a fan to being a customer. There's so much psychology behind once you buy something from someone, you're so much more likely to buy it again or to buy something else from them. Right. We're creatures of habit. We go to the same gas stations every day. We buy clothes from the same few stores. We listen to the same radio stations. If we had a great experience with someone once, we're going to want to search for that experience again and again. And your fans are no different. So if you can make an offer and, you know, fulfill that for them, 
Now they're a customer and they're much more likely to become a customer for life. So the next step on that fan journey is becoming a customer. So you offer them a CD or a T-shirt or something like that, right? They buy it and you want to nurture this relationship. So you want to over deliver. When they buy a T-shirt, don't just stop at the T-shirt. Maybe write them a handwritten note like, hey, thank you so much for being a fan of mine, for supporting us. Hey, I just wanted to let you know that I really appreciate you. Here's some stickers. Here's a, a discount for our next concert in your area. Whatever you need, just look me up. Right. And then and this process, again, is called nurturing, leading people down a path to the desired outcome. And of course, your desired outcome is to make them a super fan, because if you can make them a super fan, they can spend a hundred dollars or more on you every year. Then you're much more likely to make a real uh, successful living at this, because instead of chasing 10, 15, five dollars every now and then, you're getting hundred dollars from this person, hundred dollars from that person, and that adds up way quicker. So, of course, uh, you over deliver. You uh, talk to these people on social media. You chime in. Uh, you respond to their messages when they reach out to you. Uh, if you see someone interacts with you a lot and you're coming to their town, DM them. Say, "Hey, I want to meet up with you because I see you're really into our stuff and I appreciate what you do for us." Right? And those type of experience experiences are what turn people into your super fans the people that will do anything for you they'll drive any distance to see you they love you to death there's a girl on my facebook friend page right now and she is a diehard lupe fiasco fan we live in north carolina and she will literally travel to mississippi if that's the closest place he's going to stop at on her on his tour this year she'll find a way to get there no matter what, if Lupe Fiasco is on tour and he's not stopping in North Carolina, that does not stop her from going to see him every single year. And there are people that are going to be willing to spend that kind of money and time and attention for you. But you have to make it worth their while. You have to do things to give them these experiences. And I've got a video about super fans as well. So a lot of these questions you can have answered if you just, you know, take a look at our YouTube channel. Take a look at all these resources that we've created for you. Um, but again, a lot of the questions that I've been getting, I've been getting over and over again. So I wanted to take time to answer those for you. I hope that this podcast has been great for you, that you have clarity, that you have, you know, the strength and the guidance that you need to move forward and you understand what your next steps are. Again, if you are looking for more one on one advice from me, there are two ways to get that. You can join the Indie Club on Facebook. It's our private group. There are about 150 somewhere between 150 and 200 people right now, but it's growing exponentially. And so there's me, there's other artists, there's managers, there's publicists, there's all sorts of people in that group. And you can ask your questions and one of the community members will answer it. And if they don't, of course, I will. And so that's a great way to get feedback. Um, now, if you want time with me one on one, again, you can book a coaching call. Uh, the price is one hundred dollars for 60 minutes. Um, but if you use the promo code podcast, I'll give you twenty dollars off your first session. So that's my treat to you for listening till the end. And um, I'm really excited about having you guys on this journey with us or for you allowing me to be a part of your journey in music. Again, I hope this was helpful and I hope you stay in contact with us. You can follow us on social media. Please subscribe to the show. Leave us a review, a rating and leave a comment. Let me know how you found out about us. I'd love to get to know you more. But until next time, thanks for listening. Peace.